Hey everybody, I'm, uh, I'm excited that we're launching into a, a new four part message series called Love Lockdown, Marriage in the Time of Corona. Actually, I'm mostly not excited about it. I'm mostly terrified if I'm being totally honest and I'll tell you a couple of reasons why. Uh, first of all, I have felt led. I think it was the leading of God that we need to talk frankly about marriages that are under attack at our church. I assume that we as NAC are a, a microcosm of what is going on across Canada and across Christianity as a whole. But for sure, um, I know that NAC marriages are, are feeling the pressure. So uh, months ago, I was thinking, this is a series we need to do. And then coronavirus happened and everything was disrupted. And I thought, is a marriage series really what we need when uh, the world is blowing up? Is this really even relevant anymore? And it turns out it might be more relevant than ever. Uh, being stuck in close quarters has, has revealed some things. Uh, for some of you, maybe it's expedited things. If, if your marriage was in bad shape before Corona, it might just have gotten a whole lot worse. And hopefully for some, it is, it has forced you to deal with things that needed to be dealt with things that, um, that, that you had been maybe able to avoid for years because you and your spouse were sort of like ships passing in the night work, school, kids, but, but your home lately has been a bit of a, a pressure cooker, right? So thank you to some of the trusted knack voices who, who said to me, this teaching is more relevant than ever. I'll tell you why else I'm not looking forward to this. You know, in 20 years of full-time ministry, I've never taught on this. I've used marriage as an illustrative point in the context of a larger series, but never done a series like this. So I'm like, could we get um, Carrie Thomas or Kevin Lehman or Tim Keller or someone with credibility? Because I have this very... Uh, low tolerance for hypocrisy of any kind and the idea of me sharing wisdom on marriage because if you know my marriage and some of you do or if you asked my kids about our marriage you'd find out very quickly how messed up and immature and broken we are and I guess that's an excuse because I probably just described every marriage um, and me sharing biblical wisdom about relationships, even stuff that we have a hard time living out consistently, that I have a hard time living out consistently, it doesn't make it any less true. Amen? Uh, two more things that give me pause. Right now in our church, there are those who are watching this or maybe those who are connected loosely with our church family. And you are in marriages that are on the verge of ending. You are in a, a scary place. And the thought of doing a little 30 minute marriage message with three points and a funny illustration just seemed the epitome of trite to those marriages in particular. You know, there are some relationships that are going to need a heck of a lot more than a Sunday morning message. You're going to need intensive counseling, maybe years of hard work, making uh, baby step changes and dramatic changes to your relationship habits. And so, you know, this may be such a minuscule piece of that solution for you, if at all. And lastly, my concern for not wanting to do this series is that you know, I want every Sunday teaching to be applicable to, to everybody. So what about the, the single person or the widowed person or the divorced person or the teenager? Uh, listen, I, I promise you this, whether you are in a healthy marriage, an unhealthy marriage, you're single, thinking one day you might be married or or you're married to a non-Christian or you're divorced or widowed and you're thinking, I never want to be married again. 
there will be something here for you, if nothing else, if nothing else. Uh, you all know people who are married or getting married or want to get married. And you need to arm yourself with, with wisdom so you can be a friend and a counselor and a pastor to them. So, so this is for you today. So I talked about my objections and, uh, and I talked myself out of my objections. And then Vicki had this great idea. What if, what if she were to respond to the teaching, you know, sort of give the female point of view, call me on the stuff I forgot or brushed over, be able to say, um, yes, darling, but have you thought about this? And so that's what we're going to do in this series, have a bit of a male female perspective to you know, keep us honest. I'm, I'm thinking out loud here, but like maybe one week we'd have somebody like a Kelly Garby, who's a licensed counselor. And she, she might give the female perspective, sort of throwing her under the bus in real time. But maybe one week Chris would do the teaching and, and then Mike Stosky would give the male point of view, sort of just working this out as we go. But the point is we, we come to this topic humbly. Um, we know we need each other to keep us honest. And I hope that this will be helpful and that God is going to be glorified in the midst of it. And that you'll see God actually has a better way to do life and relationships and marriages. Okay. Longest preamble in the history of preambles. Um, I'm curious, ladies, let's start, let's start with you. Now I'm cautious not to make sort of these sweeping gender generalizations, you know, men and women are never 100% homogenous in anything, but there are some sort of truisms, like usually at least 80% rule that sort of prove the stereotype. So, so ladies, let's start with you. How many of you, when you were a little girl, fantasized one day about having the perfect wedding with the perfect guy living in the perfect little house and you even named your perfect children before you even had them right okay men let's talk about you you probably had a, a little different fantasy when you were a teenager it was pretty simple how many of you dreamed about getting married and having sex twice a day now i want to talk to everybody how many of you are still dreaming okay keep dreaming. It's, it's interesting how sometimes our expectations of what we hope marriage will be seems to fall way short of what it actually is. And when you look around today, you have to admit that so many marriages are just not working. In fact, it's really, really scary when you start to read the statistics and depending on the article you read or what survey or study you read, uh, you've heard the stats. It is somewhere in the neighborhood of 50% of marriages that don't make it. And, and that's horrifying. You think about it in any other area of life. If there was something important that you could lose and there was a 50% chance that you would lose it. Don't you think you would approach it seriously and do everything imaginable to eliminate that risk? I mean, if there was a, 50% chance uh, that you were going to get attacked by a bear when you go to the mailbox, you're probably going to go out in full armor and maybe borrow one of Glenn's guns. Or maybe you just be like, mail's overrated anyway. Who needs Amazon Prime, right? With the odds being what they are in marriage, I would argue that the reason um, many marriages are struggling is because so often people are not actually spiritually prepared to live a marriage that honors God. So today I, I want to talk about this, this one word priority, keeping the priorities in the proper place in our relationships. And you're not going to want to miss next week. We're, we're going to talk about pursuit. How do we continue to pursue when the, <laughs> When the prophet and uh, poet B.B. King said, the thrill is gone. And week number three could get a little bit tricky because we're going to talk about what it means to fight fair. Um, I want to start with a very 
common belief in our world today. Your little kids are taught this from Disney princess movies or fairy tales, but it's a very common idea that to really be fulfilled in life, you have to meet the one to really be happy, um, to really have a life that has meaning. You have to meet that one perfect person that gives you goosebumps. You know, the one that every love song on the radio makes you go, oh, I finally get, I get this song. You know, if your life was an emoji, it would be this one. Um, to really be fulfilled in life, you have to find the one. To really be happy in life, you have to find the one. You know, for those of, of you not married, what I'm hoping is after this message, instead of saying, I just met the one, he's so cute, you know, he's, he's got a job. Last three guys didn't even have a job. Or she's amazing, she, she's the one. At least, at least she's the one who, who responded to my okay Cupid, right? So she must be the one. Instead, of what I hope you say is, I think I just found the two. He's so amazing, she's so amazing. I think I just met the two. Why would you be excited about meeting the two? Well, if you're taking notes, it's because God is your one and your spouse is your two. God is your one and your spouse is your two. And even Jesus said this really clearly when someone said, hey, what's the most important command? He said, above anything else, make God number one. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength. God is first and then people come next. This is, this is called priority. To really have a marriage that honors God, we put God first in our relationship and then our spouse is number two. And I want to say to those of you that one day hope to be married, um, may this be your mindset that I'll seek the one while preparing for my two. I will seek the one while preparing for my two. I like how Andy Stanley puts it. He says, become the person you're looking for is looking for. I love that. Let me say that again. Become the person that you're looking for is looking for. In other words, you know, I'm going to seek the one. I'm going to live for God. My whole life is going to be devoted to him. He is king. He's first in my life. He's, he's preparing me for someone that I can serve him with. But he's always my one. I'll seek the one while he prepares me for my two. So for those of you that are married and are Christ followers, this is your commitment. I promise, I promise God will be my first priority and my spouse will be my second. And maybe that doesn't sound particularly romantic to you. It's because you've been watching too many Ryan Gosling movies, quite frankly. So, so this is a concept that begins right in Genesis chapter two. Right at the beginning, the context here is Adam is, is living alone and there's no suitable partner for him. And God says, this ain't good. And he, and he put him into a deep sleep and he formed Eve and Adam saw her and he said, whoa, man. And so God named her woman. Stupid, stupid dad joke. Sorry for that. I'll edit it out. Um, but then Genesis 2, 20, 2, 24 says, this is why a man leaves his father and mother is to be united with his wife and they become one flesh. And that word comes from a, a root Hebrew word that means to, to loosen or relinquish. In other words, when you're growing up, your priority relationship is, is mom and dad. You always honor mom and dad, but your priority shifts from that um, being your primary relationship to now it's your spouse. Uh, your God is your one and your spouse becomes your primary human relationship. And so the problem is so often when we believe you have to meet the one just to be happy. When you believe that your spouse is your one, you know what's going to happen? Eventually you will idolize somebody and then one day you demonize them. You idolize them. 
oh, you're amazing. You're perfect. You're everything. You're all I've ever wanted. You know, ladies will be like, oh, he's so laid back. He's so relaxed. Then you get married, you demonize the same guy. He's a lazy bum. He won't mow the yard. You idolize, you demonize. Oh, she's so, she's so organized. She's so driven. She's amazing. Get married, demonize. She's so controlling. She's driving me crazy. And the problem is you're, you're asking your spouse to meet a need that they were not designed to meet because God is designed to meet your number one need of priority and not your spouse. Together, you serve God, but that person is not designed to meet the need that only God can meet. You know, this is kind of what tends to happen when you're early on, right? You make your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your priority. And maybe when you get married, you you still have that priority, but then kids come along and suddenly instead of the marriage relationship being the priority under God, suddenly the kids are the priority. And then sometimes the husband even gets a little jealous. He's like, nobody's paying attention to me. And so he pours himself into work and maybe the wife ends up dropping off the kids at daycare and she pours herself into work and suddenly the marriage relationship gets put on the shelf. Now fast forward to your deathbed, if, if that's not too grim an exercise. Um, if you're blessed enough to even have weeks maybe to prepare for eternity, that's where priority becomes incredibly clear. You know, as a pastor, I've been with people at the end and there's two things that matter always God and family. You may not even believe in God your whole life, but, but on your deathbed, if there's a God, it's like, I wonder where I stand. You know, God becomes a priority. Is my family nearby? Family becomes a priority. And so God is my number one priority. My spouse is my number two. You know, whenever anything takes the place of God or takes the place of the priority of the marriage relationship, even something good, right? When those priorities are out of order, your, your marriage can never be what God intended it to be because you're not living according to the God ordained priorities. If I can be just totally honest, 20 years now in, in vocational ministry. And frankly, sometimes the church has taken priority over my marriage over Vicky. Is the church a good thing? Of course it is. When it's healthy and well-led and spirit-filled, it's actually God's chosen method of, of gospeling the world. But it's not supposed to be my number one thing. It's not even supposed to be my number two. You can see how, how pastors like me could easily justify it though, right? Well, this is my calling you know, souls are at stake. It's not like I've made alcohol or money or, or pornography, you know, my number one thing, like it's, it's God's church. Can you imagine the, the irony of placing God's church over God himself? It's ridiculous. It's shameful because so often it's not something bad that ruins a marriage. Think about that. So often it's something good that is not in the right priority. God is my one. My spouse is always my two. And we have to live according to these priorities if we, if we want to really honor God. Now, would, would Vicky have legitimacy in feeling jealousy about all the time and energy given to the church? Isn't jealousy always wrong? You know, there's such a thing as legitimate jealousy. In fact, God has been known to be a jealous God. There's a sinful jealousy that uh, there's a legitimate jealousy. Anytime we, we put anything ahead of God, he is legitimately and righteously jealous. It's called an idol. If, if you put anything ahead of God, he has the right because of who he is, a holy and righteous God, 
to be legitimately jealous. And that's why, you know, every now and then you may find yourself in your marriage go, I'm, I'm a little bit jealous of your time with the kids. Because truthfully, yes, we need to have time with the kids, but our marriage relationship should be a priority to keep it, to keep it strong so we can be a, a blessing to the kids. Well, I'm jealous of your time with your friends. Well, I'm jealous of your time with your friends. You know, there are psycho people who think you should never have a friend. I'm not talking about that, but I'm, I'm talking about if you're always out doing something else and not, you know, making your marriage a priority, that's a legitimate jealousy. I know some people that are jealous over their spouse's phone right next to each other in bed. You know, there's other things to do in bed. There's a legitimate jealousy because your phone is in the wrong place in the priorities. And that's why I, I, I want to give you one big thought, one simple thought today. Protect the priorities. Protect the priorities. You know, my God is my first priority and my spouse is my second. There's some marriages, not all. But, but some struggling today, and it can be traced to this root issue of not putting God first. You want your marriage to grow? Serve Him in church together. Seek Him first every single day. Pray together. Be centered around God's Word. Seek Jesus together. Put Him first, and then make sure you come together, and your relationship with each other is number two. You know, I want to get up into your business a little bit and, and tell you some things that are going to make some of you mad, but it's only because I love you and because it's true. Do not be child centered in your marriage. Oh, children are amazing. Children are a, a gift from God. But if you want to love your kids, prioritize your marriage. That seems counterintuitive, doesn't it? You know, one of the best ways you can be a blessing to your children is to strengthen your marriage. Some of you, unfortunately, your whole life revolves around the kids and your marriage has, has paid for it. It's, it's the common interest that keeps some of y'all together. And one day, as the kids grow up and you look at each other and go, who are you? And, and what did you do with the person I married 25 years ago? And suddenly you don't have any intimacy because your whole life has revolved around your children. Here's what you need to understand and remember. Children at home are a temporary assignment. They're a temporary assignment. You will have them for 19, 20 years, though in this housing market, they may be there for 30 years or whatever. You may, you may have them for 30 years, but at some point it's healthy to push them out and say, you go serve Jesus and live on your own. Now, they never stop being your kids, right? But the kind of investment we're talking about here is, is a temporary assignment. Your marriage, on the other hand, is till death do us part. You know, it's not until we're not happy anymore. It's not until you're not meeting my needs anymore. It's not until something better comes along. It's not, oh, I'm going to, you know, trade you in for a different model. It's till death do us part. Your marriage is a permanent God honoring commitment. And that's why we have to continue to prioritize it even above children. And that doesn't mean there aren't some seasons in life where you don't um, probably spend inordinately more time with your children than you do investing in your marriage because that's what that season of life requires of you. But it is unsustainable for a marriage in the long run. And by the way, if you want your children to succeed in marriage, show them what a God-honoring marriage looks like. You know, keeping Christ first doesn't 
really work together unless we, we have it individually first. So what works the best is that we both have authentic individual relationships with Christ. And so it just makes it so much more natural that when we're together, that, that Christ is our life. It's just not something that can be separated from, from who we are as a couple. And what I, what I want to acknowledge for a moment here is that there are so many hurting relationships right now. And I, I hurt with you. Our hearts break. What we're talking about today, what I, what I want you to understand is really simple, but it's not easy. Okay. It is not easy. You have to work hard. It seems like everything in society just, just pulls us away from each other. And, and so if I could, let me just talk to the men for a second, because I feel a little more freedom to talk to the guys. I'll let Vicky maybe get up in the girls business, but for the guys this morning, what I want to tell you is, um, Maybe even if I could just charge you, take responsibility to protect the priorities because you're protectors, right? Gentlemen, if someone breaks into your house and attempts to attack your family, how many of you will fight back? Hands down, no doubt about it, right? I don't care if you're in your tidy whities you turn into Chuck Norris, like you'll, 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 you'll get kitchen utensils and turn them into nunchucks. In my house, every room has a weapon in it. I'll, I'll use a lamp to take you out. Okay. You mess with my family and you're going to have to kill me to stop me. I'll protect my family. That's easy because that's what we're wired to do as guys. We will, we will die for those that we love. In fact, it's almost easier to get our heads around dying for the ones we love than to live for those that you love. You know, every single day, the ministry of just daily faithfulness. Oh, dang, I just got up in someone's personal business right now, didn't I? Gentlemen, I hope you understand um, you are charged by God essentially to live for or to give your best for two things, for Christ and to lay down your life for your wife. That, that's, what, that's what you're called to do. Protect those priorities. In fact, we skipped over this in our Ephesians series because I knew that we'd get to this later. But in, in Ephesians 5.25, it says, Husbands, here's your calling. Love your wives. That's your calling. Love them, serve them, honor them. He says, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and did what? Gave himself up for her. So protect the priorities at all costs. What does that mean? Guys, we keep God first. We are, we are people connected to Christ's body, the church. We bring our families to church. We serve the church. We are people of the word. We read the Bible. We're modeling this for our kids. We make time for God and for our wife. When everything pulls us away, we, we make guarded time to talk. If you don't talk, you can't have intimacy. And I mean, as practical as it is, we're going to have to carve out time for date night. Some of you, you're, you're going to tell me you can't afford it. You don't have time. Listen, if you're lazy, you'll make an excuse. If you love, you'll make a way, you know, you'll put on Netflix in the other room lock the door, give your kids some Benadryl, put on some romantic music and dance the night away, whatever. Just, just don't tell me you can't afford Netflix and Benadryl. If you're in a small group by now, you'd already have a free babysitter, right? Once the isolating is over, drop the kids off at their house for the next week. Uh, it'll be your turn. And, and uh, you know, when Vicky and I were first married and we were dirt poor, like our date night was at West Edmonton Mall, just, just people watching, sort of making up little internal monologues for them as they walked by. Oh, I'm bringing the sweater vest back. It was just dumb, but it, we, it was fun. We made each other laugh. So what are we going to do? We're going to protect 
the priority at all costs. Why? Because you never can be fulfilled in life until you finally meet the one. You never can be fulfilled in life until you know the Lord God as your one. God is your one and your spouse is your two. I will always honor God as my first priority and my wife will always be my second. And I'll protect those priorities with everything in me. And and if I start there, the foundation will be laid to have a, a marriage that can truly honor God. And that is worth building a life on. Okay. Let's see if Vicki has something to add to this. Take it away. Hi, I just watched the sermon. And as Jonathan mentioned, I'm going to be bringing my own perspective, some things that I thought of while listening to it and and ways that God even spoke to me during the sermon. So uh, the first thing that I would say is a huge component, and I don't want us to miss this. I don't want to gloss it over and think that it's a nice, challenging sermon. It's the thing. It is that God is number one in our life. And I'm so challenged by that. I'm so humbled by the knowledge that I don't do it right. Um, and I would challenge all of you. Do you do it? Do we all, any of us do it? Um, I can think of a couple people that I would say, I know that they put God first and it's older people. Um, a lot of the time because they've learned what happens when they don't put God first. So That's a huge one. That's like priority number one, as Jonathan said. And then spouses, number two. Our marriage is our second priority. And whew, I don't do that. Well, I mess that one up. I can imagine a lot of you do. That changes so much of how we order our day, doesn't it? It's totally life-changing. Jonathan challenged uh, the guys, especially in the area of that protector and we would you know guys would be the first to protect their families and how do we change that to do that daily on a daily basis well i actually really resonate with that piece that protective that mama bear part two and another thing occurred to me though as i was listening to that for women and i know this happens for men too um there is this sense that the grass is greener. It's a temptation I know that the enemy puts in our minds. And we have years of rom-coms, romantic comedies, even princess movies that will kind of build up that lie that the grass is greener, that there's this one person that's perfect. And as you get into marriage, you realize they're not perfect and, and things are challenging in marriage. And so then this must not be the right one. But That grass is greener mentality that that there's someone better out there for me is such a lie. And it actually, what it does is it closes off your heart to seeing the way that God is providing for you through your spouse that you're married to, um, the way that they're specifically wired and gifted in ways God wants to use them to grow you. And so once you're thinking of the grass is greener, that other some person out there, you are closing off the ability to see what God wants to do through the person you're married to. So what does it look like to prioritize your day when you are putting God first and your spouse second? And this is me and you would have maybe a different list or add to the list. Uh, Meeting with him first thing in the day, asking him to meet with me, Um, confession, worship time, delighting in his creation by going for a walk, asking him what he wants from me for that day. And a big one would be to wait and listen to him. Pray for your spouse. Ask God, God, how can I be love to my husband today? How can I be your love to my wife today? When I have prayed that prayer, (laughs) I get so many ideas throughout the day. You wouldn't believe it. I get so many great ideas and I would encourage you to pray out loud because this is what it does. It sends out a battle cry to the unseen world. It says, I am putting God and my marriage 
first today. And as Jonathan talked about again last week, that's a real thing that we are in a battle. When I don't prioritize and put God first and then Jonathan second, especially when a few of those days are strung together, this is what happens. I am self-focused. I am easily offended, defensive. Um, I overlook my own sin and my own need for God. And then I become hopeless and feel hopeless about my marriage. Putting my relationship in the right order can look actually like having a hard conversation with Jonathan instead of pushing my own feelings down for the sake of just smoothing out things in the moment. Something else I would say that really stood out to me is that you don't need your spouse to agree for you to put God first. So Jonathan and I didn't pray together a lot throughout our marriage. We prayed a lot separately from each other. We prayed with other people, um, especially as Jonathan's job in ministry started. He prayed a lot, um, but we didn't pray a lot together. There's something really humbling and vulnerable about praying with your spouse. And I'll give you an example of that, a very, very recent and fresh example. The other night, I did something that bugged Jonathan and he said something to me about it in a way that irritated me. So I got irritated and I decided ah, it's time for bed. By the time I was crawling into the covers, he was in bed. <sighs> I was still irritated. So I got in and I turned over on my side away from him. And he said, do you want to pray? Oh, I was, <laughs> I was irritated and it wasn't even a big thing. It was just a human reaction to his human reaction. But I love when he asks to pray. I really do. And so what happened next is we had to sort out what the irritation, that little interaction would happen there. So we did. And it didn't take too long of some back and forth sharing our honest feelings that we actually started laughing together. We held hands and then it was wonderful. We could come to God and ask for his help. And my heart felt right to do it because I was humbled again. I was um, not feeling anger or resentment or holding anything against him. Couples, I know it's hard to start praying together if it's not been something that you've done. And so I have written down a prayer that I would like to read and as an example of just how you can pray. It's really short. I encourage you to actually keep it short um, to the point. God, we need you. Today, we choose to change our priorities so that you are first and our marriage second. Forgive us for messing this up. Heal the places that need healing. Guide us as we choose you and each other moving forward. Amen. Amen. Let's just take a moment to pray. Father, thank you so much that you're, you're going to equip and empower us to honor you. God, I know there are many relationships right now that are hurting and struggling today. And we pray, God, that they would put you first, reprioritize their life around that which matters most, and that they would find healing through your son, Jesus. Father, today I pray for those who would one day be married. God, that you would give them a foundation of righteousness to build upon, that they would seek you with all their hearts today. And God, as they seek you, they'd be conformed to the image of your son, Jesus, becoming more like him as you are preparing them to serve you with their number two. And God, I pray for those 
who are married today. I pray for those marriages that are strong, that they would even be strengthened and protected from the attacks of the evil one. God, I pray for those who are just kind of floating along and those that are struggling in a significant way. God, may the conversations that even take place today and this week to come, may, may they be productive and just full of grace, looking, looking for ways to improve their marriage, not throwing accusations, but God seeking you to change us, to become who you want us to be, to serve you better with our two, bring healing, bring intimacy, bring restoration. Some of you right now, you just feel the disappointment and the regret of what you don't have, of what your spouse can't provide. And um, I would just remind you, God wants to be your number one. I hope you'll understand he's a jealous God. When, when you put anything else ahead of him, he calls it an idol. It's, it's a misplaced priority. So we have this holy, righteous God sitting on a throne and he wants to be first in your life. And maybe this would even somehow help you recognize your own lack, your own sin, and when you recognize that you're a sinner, then you'll recognize that you need a savior. And, and this is why God is so amazing because anyone who calls on his name will be saved, sins forgiven, life made completely brand new. So maybe Lord, even in this marriage talk, there would be those who realize they need a savior today and would turn to you. I pray it in your strong name. In the name of Jesus, the name above every other name. Amen.